Let me ask you about Travis, Kayla, and maybe a few of the other athletes you've been involved with. So first, Travis. Mm -hmm. Travis Stevens, Olympic silver medalist, three-time Olympian, 2008, 2012, 2016. What makes Travis Stevens great? What makes him so successful? What makes him unique in your mind as an athlete? Through all the hardship he had to overcome, through his uh, weird looking Sayanagi that uh, eventually worked out nicely, through the, the full richness of his personality. In the context of all the other great athletes you've coached, what makes him special? His fight, Travis has fight. And you know, the first time I ever saw Travis Stevens was in, like recognized him, maybe I had seen him before as a younger boy or something, but like actually recognized him is, I brought a group of young kids to Italy for a competition in a training camp. And it was this program called U23 Elite. And I picked, handpicked 20 kids to go to this event. And it was the first time I coached uh, an international team. And I had never seen Travis fight before, compete, train, anything. And during this competition, you know, he's an 81 kilo player. I think he was maybe like 18 years old. Um, 17, 18 years old. And it was a really hard European event. And I think Travis won three matches and he lost two. But what stood out the most to me was like the fight he had in him. He was scrapping every fight. Like he scrapped hard. Like he wanted to win more than any of them, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't win, but he wanted to win more. And I, and I noticed that right away. And then I also noticed that after he lost his second match and he was eliminated from the tournament, I saw how disappointed he was in himself. Like he actually thought he was supposed to beat those people, even though he was like 17, right? And he's fighting against grown men that are, you know, a high level judo, much higher than he was. And I said to him, I said, hey, son, like, don't worry, man. You got a long <laughs> career ahead of you. Like, I'm glad you're disappointed, but there's so many things you don't know and so many skills you don't have. The fact that you were able to hold your own and scrap like that, like you've got a good future. And I remember calling my friend, Jason Morris, after that tournament. And I said, hey, man, do you ever hear of this kid, Travis Stevens? He says, no, why? I said, man, that kid's got some fight in him, right? And I said that. <laughs> I said that to Jason at the time. I said, that kid's got some fight in him, man. He's pretty yeah. talented, yeah. you know? And that's how it started. Yeah. Um, but so I saw that in him when he was young. But the other thing was Travis, like, there's not, there's no such thing as hard work to that guy. If you tell him to put his head through the wall and he'll, and that's how he wins, he'll go put his head through the wall. Yeah. He'll do whatever it takes for him to do to achieve success. And he hates failure more than he likes winning, 100%. He always has. He punishes himself when he doesn't do well. He makes himself work harder. He goes and you know, just uh, abuses himself yeah. when he doesn't when he doesn't succeed because he's so heartbroken and disappointed in himself. So that's a trait that I think all of the athletes that I work with, like closely, those they all had that same trait. They hated losing more than anything. They would they would break their arm. They'd fall on their head. You know, they'd rather get hit by a car than lose a judo tournament. Yeah. You know, and, they, and, and as a result, then they all had fight and they all were willing to train. They were willing to listen. And they would do anything for victory. You know, within, you know, within the rules, I'm not talking about taking drugs or anything like that, yeah. but they would, they'd give a hundred percent of themselves for victory. And, you know, Travis was somebody that when he was down, he found a way to do, to get better doing something else. If he couldn't do standing, that's when he started jujitsu. He couldn't go on his feet anymore. He couldn't stand up and train. I might as well go learn jujitsu and get good on the ground. Yeah. Right. Because I can, you know, so he always found a way no matter what obstacle was in his way, he just went around it. So what about the, it'd be interesting to get your perspective, because I know Travis's perspective is the, just the number of injuries. Like, what do you make of the perseverance through all the injuries he had to overcome? Specifically, like you just observing this creature that you've coached. I mean, he seems to not see the injuries as, as a problem. He just like, <laughs> just like you said, head through the wall, it's like what, like when I, when we were talking about injuries, he kind of, he doesn't even see the injuries in themselves as the problem because he thinks that the injuries, you know, you heal back stronger. I, I forget the exact quote, but he said like, 
my body is l is now less injury prone than most of anyone else. Because I've already broken everything. I've broken everything. <laughs> and it's just grown back stronger. Like, because I asked him something like, do you regret sort of pushing your body to s s all of those places that resulted in those injuries? He, he was, his response was like, no, I'm stronger now. Right. So <laughs> I don't know if that's justification, but that certainly describes a mindset that, yeah, head through the wall that doesn't, uh, it's almost not dramatic. Like, look, I got this injury. It's so, I'm so like brave and special for overcoming this injury. He's just, he just that's part of the job and he gets the job done but like that job involves well, you know, a lot of injuries <laughs> one of the talks i gave travis and that team at that at that particular tournament was at the very beginning of the camp after the tournament i said to them listen my my vision i shared my vision with them mm -hmm. i said my vision is you know in seven years because that was 2005 i said in seven years i want to have a u.s team that steps on the mat that is ready to kick ass mm -hmm. And in order to get there, all of you guys can be a part of this team and part of this process, but in order to get there, you guys have to be the first ones to practice. You have to be the last ones to leave because we have to work harder than the rest of the world because we're up against all odds. I said, I am sick of America being a laughing stock of judo and being the first round easy match warm up for everybody else. I said, if you get injured, you're not going to be on the side with with you know, with a ice bag on taking off rounds and then get back on the mat the next day and tell me you're okay. Mm -hmm. If you can train the next day, you can train today. Mm -hmm. So there's no injury. The only time you're leaving this dojo is if the ambulance has to take you out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I do think subliminally, Travis bought into that message and heard that message then mm -hmm. and said, if I'm gonna be a champ, then that's the way I'm gonna yeah. do it. And he did. Yeah. And he, he embodied it, he lived it. Man, there were many times in Europe where I said, dude, just tape it up, go, go off to the side, just take the day off, like take the rest of the day off, you're beat up, you can't do it. He said, no, no, I'm gonna tape it up, I'm gonna tape it up. I said, no, you don't need to right now. And he said, no, Sensei, I'm doing it. I'm, you know, the, the ambulance isn't taking me out, it's just, my, right. it's just my wrist, it's just my ankle, it's just my it's wrist. It's just my ankle. You know, uh, it's- Yeah, I love it. Yeah, what about the, so the other really big thing is you comment on a little bit is the weight cut. So early in his career, he was 81 kg, and that was presumably not so difficult. But later in his career, he is 81 kg, and it's becoming more and more difficult. So that's that's the other thing with him. Is uh, So I've known a lot of really, really tough people at the highest levels broken by the weight cut. Like that can break the toughest minds. And it doesn't seem to have broken him. And he's delivered on it often on like insane weight cuts. So um, just as a coach, what do you think about his particularly, his mind and the challenge of the weight cut? It was part of his process. It was part of his way of getting ready for battle. That, Suffering? <laughs> yeah, it really was. And if I'm gonna suffer this much, then I'm gonna make my opponents pay yeah. for all the suffering that I went through to get here. Yeah. That was his mindset. Um, Later on in his career, you're right. Like a lot of times, Travis, he would never step on a scale, you know, until he got to the tournament, you know. And even when he get to the tournament, like he'd weigh like 90 kilos. He'd show up at the tournament nine kilos over. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, you have to, but I never, it, it was just an expectation of making weight. Not making weight was never an option for any of our athletes. And Travis knew it. And he said, as a professional, my job is to make weight. If I don't make weight, he, you know, he he was never going to allow that to happen, and he was never going to allow us to come to him and say, "Hey, I told you," you know, because he losing wasn't an option, making a weight wasn't not making weight was not an option for him ever either. But you know, a lot of times he wouldn't even he'd be nine kilos over on the plane going over to the tournament and have to make weight three days later, you know, and he didn't break eighty six kilos until the day before the tournament. Like he had five kilos over the day before. Yeah. That was his way. But he would do three workouts, you know, wake up in the morning, work out, then he'd eat, then he'd work out in the afternoon, then he'd eat again, then he'd, he'd work out again at night, and then he'd reward himself. Hey, I worked out three times today. He'd go have a, you know, a, a Mountain Dew. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or a chocolate bar, you know, and then he's next morning, he's, up, you know, back up to 87, and he would never touch weight until the morning of weigh -ins. That That's a, 
when he that he he wasn't on weight f- for more than like five minutes. His process would break a lot of people. So the fact that he got the job done is not just the job done, but every single time every single he got time. the job done. And I made those athletes fight. We would fight in Paris. We would do a camp for a week, double session camp for a week. He'd be seven kilos over, have to fight the next weekend. We're talking two or three days later. Mm-hmm. You know, So not only did he make the weight, but he did a grueling training camp twice a day and, and, and then cut weight and then fought again. Then did another camp for a week in double session training camp and then fought on a third weekend in a row. And our athletes went through hell. You know, All of our athletes went through hell because on the tour around the world, they fought in every event, they did every camp, they fought in every event, whereas most of the other teams, like Japan comes in and fights in Paris, then they go home. You know, They maybe do a camp for three days, then they go home. They don't stay in Europe for four or five weeks straight and fight in every tournament. And when you get to Germany, the Germans skip the French Open. They skip the camp in France. They're just getting ready for Germany. Our athletes already had two competitions, two training camps, two weight, three weight cuts now. And then, so they're not 100% when they fight in Germany, but that's all part of the experience they need, the training that they need that they don't get here in, the, in, in this country. And all of those were just preparation for our world championships or our Olympic games. So by the time our athletes got to those tournaments, they felt so strong, so rested, so like, Man, this guy f- that felt like a monster in Germany feels like nothing today mm-hmm. it's because you're fully rested now, you know? But part of the challenge is because the American team is smaller and more, I mean, just smaller is, um, you know, all the different places you go for to do the weight cut, to do the diet, to do the preparation or the recovery. There's like that process changes every time. So it's it, you basically have to improvise a lot. Oh yeah. So you show up to a hotel, and how you do the weight cut, you don't know, and there's right. the different weather conditions. It's not. It's like, um, so what is it, Rocky versus Drago, right? Right. It. Right. So you don't have you have to just improvise, and that that's also a fascinating part of the American judo story, which is like you have to improvise more. Well, I was funny because when I it was 1990, and it was at the Goodwill Games. Right, and uh, we were. It was a U.S. Olympic Committee type event, and so we're on the bus with the the swim team, and it was me and Jason Morris on the American team, and we're going to the judo competition, but we're on the bus with the swim team. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to the venue where we're staying, and I remember being like by ourselves with no staff, no 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 manager, no coach. We're just by ourselves going to fight in Russia, mm-hmm. right? And uh, <laughs> And the swim team's on there with their full sweats and their staff and like their managers. And I, I heard the lady, the girl go, I'm sorry, this is 1994 because it was in St. Petersburg, Russia. So I heard the girl on the team, she goes up to the coach, she goes, coach, um, do you think you can send the massage therapist to my room at 10 a.m.? You know, I'm feeling kind of jet lag. I looked at me and Jason, looked at, <laughs> we looked at each other like, she's she, she scheduling a massage? Like, yeah. We don't even have a staff. Yeah. Like what the hell is going on here? You know, what a difference in yeah. sporting, you know, different sports within the same country, you know. and uh, But that, I mean, not to romanticize things, but that you do represent the spirit of the Olympics when you're kind right. of uh, the the uh, improvisational nature of it. Because it, it is just you, you and sometimes you and the coach and just pure guts yep. and you against the world with no Warrior. money. The warrior spirit. The warrior yeah. spirit. 